Hello, we're glad to have you with us today in this study of God's Word. We hope our study will be of benefit to you and that it will encourage you and enlighten you and help you to understand more of God's Word. We're talking today about the subject of backsliding. Backsliding is a biblical expression. It is used about 15 times in the Bible. It's used 12 times or more by the prophets Jeremiah and Hosea to describe the condition of Israel in their day. For example, in Jeremiah 3, 6, Jeremiah writes, The Lord said also to me in the days of Josiah the king, Have you seen what backsliding Israel has done? She has gone up on every high mountain and under every green tree, and there played the harlot. In Jeremiah 3 and verse 8, Then I saw that for all the causes for which backsliding Israel had committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a certificate of divorce, yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but went and played the harlot also. So not only did Israel uh, sin against God and against themselves, but Judah did as well. And he said they slid back, or they were backslidden. In Jeremiah 3, verses 12 and 13, go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, return backsliding Israel says the Lord, I will not cause my anger to fall on you, for I am merciful, says the Lord. I will not remain angry forever. Only acknowledge your iniquity, that you have transgressed against the Lord your God, and have scattered your charms to alien deities under every green tree. And you have not obeyed my voice, says the Lord. And then in Jeremiah chapter 8, verses 5 and 6, why has this people slidden back? Jerusalem, in a perpetual backsliding. They hold fast to deceit. They refuse to return. I listened and heard, but they do not speak aright. No man repented of his wickedness, saying, what have I done? Every one turned to his own course as the horse rushes into battle. And so we see that talking about every one turned to his own course is the same Hebrew word that means backslidden. They slid back. But what is the definition of backsliding or backslidden? It means to slide back. It means to lapse morally. It means apostasy, turning away, falling away, retreating, lying down, drawing back, going backwards, or withdrawing. It involves unfaithfulness to God. Turning back to a life of sin from which one had freed himself or herself. That's what backsliding is. We're warned in the Bible against backsliding many times. For example, in Matthew 26 and verse 41, Jesus said, watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He warns people. You may think and desire to do the right thing, but you get involved in temptation and your flesh is weak and you'll turn back to doing the old sinful things you used to do. Hebrews 3 and verse 12 is another warning about that. In Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 12, the Bible says, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Paul wrote in in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. And 2 Peter 1.10, Peter writes, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never fall. Or, as the New King James says, if you do these things, you will never stumble. So we're warned over and over again in the New Testament and in numerous other passages about the danger of backsliding, of lapsing, morally and spiritually, turning away from the Lord, retreating, and following after Satan. There are some examples of backsliding in the Bible that we need to be aware of, and they're in the Bible so that we might learn from them. The Christians in the region of Galatia had not been Christians very long, but some of them were giving serious consideration to rejecting the New Testament of our Lord Jesus Christ, and going back to the law of Moses, which had been abrogated 
by the death of Christ on the cross. So in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 4, Paul writes, you are severed from Christ. Ye would be justified by the law. You are fallen away from grace. So there's backsliding. If anybody seeks to be justified by the law of Moses, a law that no longer has its power, that has been done away with, with the death of the Savior on the cross, then that person has severed himself from Christ and fallen away from the grace of God. That's backsliding, friend. Simon the sorcerer is an example of one who was a backslider. Simon was a man who had been converted under the preaching of Philip the Evangelist in the city of Samaria. In Acts chapter 8, we read about his conversion to Christ and how that Peter and John came from Jerusalem to Samaria as apostles to impart various miraculous spiritual gifts to these new converts in Samaria. In Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 18, and going down through verse 22, and when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them, that's the apostles, money, saying, give me this power also that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. Simon had slid back into his old ways of trickery and deceit, or at least he was thinking perhaps about that. He wanted to buy the power to give the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter said, this is none of your business, Simon. And you, because your heart is not right, you need to repent. Simon was a backslidden member of the body of Christ. and Peter calls upon him to repent. There's another man in the New Testament like this. His name is Demas, who had been a fellow worker, a brother in Christ with the apostle Paul. But Paul writes a very sad and tragic story about Demas in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10. Paul says, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world and has departed for Thessalonica. Here was a man who had been devoted in his service to the Lord, but the present world, the world of that day, had its allurements, its enticements, and Demas was drawn away by the world. And we never read that Demas ever came back to Christ. How sad that is. The Christians in Ephesus also had this problem. In Revelation 2, verses 4 and 5, Jesus said to them, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. They had slidden back. Remember, therefore, from whence you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. So Jesus is giving them fair warning, admonishing them and encouraging these people, Christians in Ephesus, to repent of their sins, to get back to that love they had for him when they, as, as when they first obeyed the gospel. But what are the results or consequences of backsliding? Let's say someone obeys the gospel of Christ and for a while serves the Lord and worships the Lord faithfully and brings great joy in heaven and great joy to brothers and sisters in Christ and the church. And then over a period of time, this individual begins to lose his or her faith. They become immoral or they become uh, spiritually bankrupt and they depart from faithful service faithful Christian living, and they go back to the sinful way of the world. What are the consequences? Well, actually, when one backslides, it makes a person fit only to be trodden or trampled 
under the feet of men. How is that, someone asks. Well, in Matthew 5, in verse 13, Jesus said, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You see, when a Christian, a disciple of Jesus Christ, loses his or her Christian influence by indifference or by sinful living, Jesus says they've lost their flavor, they've lost their influence, and he says they're good for nothing except to be thrown out and trampled all over by the feet of people. Isn't that a sad story? A sad condition to be in? The consequences of backsliding involve rendering a person unfit for the kingdom of God. In Luke 9, 62, but Jesus said to him, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. That's a strong spiritual lesson coming right out of the farm, isn't it? Here's a person who has put his hand to the plow, to plow the ground, to prepare it and make it ready for planting. Here's a person who is ready to live the Christian life. <clears throat> but here's the problem. And if you've ever done any farming, you know this is true. You don't turn around and look back to see the row that you just plowed, because when you do, you begin to lose your direction because you're not looking ahead. You're looking backwards. And there are people who become Christians. They obey the gospel of Christ. And for a short while, they do so well. And then they turn and they look back to their old way of life. Maybe they've got some old friends or family back there that are influencing them negatively or trying to draw them back into that old way of life. And he says, if we look back, we're not fit for the kingdom of heaven. Not suitable for it. Unqualified for it. That's tragic. In fact, to be a backslidden person is a state that is worse than the state that one came out of to become a child of God. Second Peter 2, 20 through 22, Peter says, for if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. Why, Peter? Notice what he says in verse 21. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb. A dog returns to his own vomit and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. Friends, that's a pretty crude but powerful illustration. Here's a person who has lived a, an ungodly, immoral, spiritually bankrupt way of life, but they hear the gospel. They hear the beauty of the suffering Savior on the cross, the blood that was shed, the salvation that's available, and they are one to Christ. They come to him. They obey his message they become a child of God through faith, repentance, confession, and baptism into Christ. And they do so well for a while. And then over time, they begin to become entangled again in those same old things they used to do. The Bible says it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after having known it and turned away of, from that sinful way of life to go back to it. He says it's like a dog going to its own vomit and a sow that had been washed and cleaned going back and wallowing in the mire, going back into the filth and the stink of an ungodly way of life. That's the consequence of backsliding. When it comes to backsliding, when it happens, Everybody loses. 
Don't you know that? Everybody loses. There are no winners when a child of God backslides. The local church, the local congregation loses a member. How tragic that is. God loses a worker, a laborer in his kingdom. In 2 Corinthians 6 and 1, Paul talks about we then as workers together with him, that is, with God. Paul is talking about the Christians in Corinth being laborers together, laborers with one another and with God. But when a brother or sister slides back, God loses a worker. That person is no longer a fellow laborer with God. Not only that, but the brethren lose a brother or sister in Christ, a family member. Remember Demas in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 10, where Paul said, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Paul lost a brother in Christ in Demas. When Demas loved the world more than he loved Christ, that's also tragic. And then the community. The community loses the Christian's influence. The influence that person could have been for Christ is gone. In Matthew 13, 33, Jesus said in this parable, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven or yeast, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all leavened. Jesus talks about his disciples as being like leaven or yeast, which has influence when it is put in the dough to make bread. It causes the dough to rise. But when a Christian backslides, that person loses their leaven. They lose their Christian influence. The community loses that person's influence for good, and the community needed it so much. The backslider loses something also. The backslider loses his or her soul. In John 15, 1 through 6, Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch, <clears throat> as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. There are a lot of people who believe that this statement made by Christ in referring to the branches, refers to various denominations. But my friends, Jesus made it very clear when he said, you are the branches. A man who does not abide in me, one is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. You see, friends, when a child of God falls away, Backslides, the backslider loses his or her soul. There is no worse thing in this world than for a person to lose his or her soul because the soul is the most valuable, the most precious thing that each one of us has. Our attitude toward the backslider is very important. Our purpose. And our attitude toward the backslider, who is a brother or sister in Christ who has erred, who has fallen or turned away from the truth and from righteous living, 
is to be restored. We are to restore him or her in the spirit of meekness and humility, considering that it could happen to us also. Galatians 6 and 1, Paul writes, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness or gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Recognizing that any child of God may fall, we need to do our utmost to try to restore that is to bring back to faithful service those who have backslidden into the world and into sin. We're to convert that person, turn them around. James 5, verses 19 and 20 says, Brethren, notice he's talking to brethren, members of the body of Christ, brothers in Christ, if anyone among you, who? The brethren. If anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. James tells us that a child of God can become a sinner, a sinner who has turned away, who has backslidden. But our job our labor in the kingdom of God is to do our best to turn that person from the error of his way so we may save that person's soul and cover all their sins. That's our purpose. But what are some backsliding preventatives? How can I prevent myself from becoming a backslider? How can I avoid becoming a backslider? Well, I need to develop myself as a Christian spiritually. I need to add what is called the Christian graces into my life, and I've got to work on this. I've got to diligently, daily strive to become a better child of God and to develop myself spiritually. In 2 Peter 1, verses 5 through 10, Peter tells us what we must do. <clears throat> he said, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours, and abound, you'll be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. You'll never fall. Can I live in such a way that I will never fall? Yes. How? By adding these Christian graces into my life. And if I don't, then I have blinded myself spiritually, and I am going to fall from the grace of God. We must meet the requirements for spiritual growth. First Peter 2 and 2, Peter says, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. And so we partake of the milk of the word, 1 Peter 2, 2, and the solid food of the word, Hebrews 5, 12 through 14, so that we may grow spiritually, develop as a Christian, become more and more dedicated to Christ. And I must spend time watching and praying, watching and praying. In Matthew 26, 41, remember what Jesus said, watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Oh, how true that is. Watch and pray. Be alert, beware, know where the dangers are, know where the temptations are coming from, and be strong enough to withstand the temptations that come into your life. Pray, 
when you find yourself becoming tempted or when you find yourself weakening with temptation, get on your knees and start praying to God. Ask for his wisdom, ask for his guidance and strength. And then take heed, pay attention, do what the Bible says. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed, lest he fall. In other words, let's not become self-righteous. Let's not become arrogant in our spiritual attitude. But take heed, lest we fall, because everybody can fall. Even the strongest Christian may fall. Hebrews 3 and verse 12, brethren, beware lest there be in any of you. Who? In the hearts of the brethren. Lest there be in any of you, what? An evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. There is the danger that we can depart from the living God. How sad, how sad that is when a child of God departs from the living God. God wanted to forgive and restore and heal the people of Israel of its sins because God is a loving and patient God, a long-suffering God. In fact, in Hosea chapter 14, verses 4 through 7, God said, I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely, for my anger has turned away from him. I will be like the dew to Israel. He shall grow like the lily and lengthen his roots like Lebanon. His branches shall spread. His beauty shall be like an olive tree. His fragrance like Lebanon. Those who dwell under his shadow shall return. They shall be revived like grain and grow like a vine. Their scent shall be like the wine of Lebanon. This is what God wanted for Israel. But he said to have all of that, to have all of God's blessings, they've got to repent of their backsliding ways. They've got to turn around. They've got to turn away from this old way of life that leads to eternal destruction and come back to God. God wants no one to be lost, but he will not save anyone against that person's own will. We must change our will, our attitude. We must have godly sorrow for sin that brings about a change of thinking, a change of heart, a change of attitude, and results in a change of our way of life. We must repent and turn back to Jesus to be forgiven and to be saved if we are members of his church. And if, if it should be that you're listening to this video and watching it, and you have been baptized in order to receive remission of sins as commanded by Peter in Acts 2.38. You have done that, and for a while you were a faithful Christian, but now you've gone back into the world. You've let a lot of things distract you and make you angry, perhaps, make you discouraged. Maybe somebody disappointed you. Maybe a number of people disappointed you because not everybody's perfect. We all fall short. From time to time, we all do what is wrong, but we can't blame God. We can't blame the church for it. But if you're in that condition where you've gone back, you've slidden back, you need to come back to Jesus. You need to repent of that as a erring, unfaithful brother or sister in Christ. You need to confess that to the Lord, and you need to pray for forgiveness of your sins. And if you're a, a member of the body of Christ and this has been your situation, then you need to go back to the place where you last worshiped. Ask the brethren there for their love and their prayers and their support. Ask them to pray with you and for you for the forgiveness of your sins so that you may have that forgiveness. You may have that breath of fresh air, that season of refreshing from the presence of the Lord, that you may be in full fellowship with him and with your brethren and live the life that will eventually take you to heaven itself. Be faithful unto death. and He will give you the crown of life. But if you've never obeyed the gospel, today I bid you, encourage you, 
believe on Jesus Christ as the only begotten Son of God, John 8 and verse 24. Repent of your sins, Luke 13, 3. Confess the name of Christ, Matthew 10, 32 and 33. And be immersed in the waters of baptism unto the remission of sins, Acts 2, 38. Acts tells us of many people who obeyed the gospel and had their sins forgiven by being baptized in the same pattern of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And when they came up out of the watery grave of baptism, they arose to walk in newness of life. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 5. You need to do that today, to be saved, to be forgiven, to be added to the church of the Lord, and to live in such a way that heaven can be your home. We're so happy that you joined us today in this study of the Word of God. We hope that you learned something that could be a benefit to you. And as always, remember, keep your Bible open and your heart receptive to the truth.